This video is sponsored by Skillshare. I've made it pretty clear on this channel in the past that I really like watching F2, sometimes more than Formula 1, and although with the weird calendar this year I've fallen a little bit out of love with the series, I still have huge respect for it and its drivers. In fact, in the past few weeks I've felt that both F2 and F3 have been cleaner than F1, with a select few F1 drivers making some pretty rookie mistakes. I'm looking at you, Valtteri Bottas. The inspiration for today's video came when this appeared on my YouTube homepage, so after you've seen this one, I definitely recommend you give that one a watch, as it really does put in to perspective how shocking the driving was in that weekend. Now, without any more waffling about context and all that, let me give you some numbers as to how messy things were when the F2, or rather GP2, visited the Baku street circuit for the first time. In the first race of the weekend, the feature race, just 10 cars of the 22 that qualified actually made it to the chequered flag without a single reliability related DNF. That means that 12 of the 22 drivers either crashed with each other or crashed on their own in just the first race. The sprint race was a little bit cleaner with just 7 of the drivers retiring from crash damage, but even so that means that out of a maximum of 44 times the chequered flag could be seen, it was only seen 25 times. That's pretty poor by anyone's standards, if you ask me. With that little expose done, let me tell you the story of how things got this bad, and try to convince you that this was the messiest single-seater weekend ever. Qualifying for the race was, as always, held on Friday evening, where Antonio Giovinazzi took pole ahead of Nobuharu Matsushita, with last place Filo Armand fairly worrying 6 seconds slower than the pole time, although this would probably be because he performed a Mahavir style manoeuvre on an escape road, bringing out the red flag as he did so. The first real incident of the weekend came just 138 metres after lights out, where Pierre Gasly tried to send it up the inside of Norman Nato, who failed to spot him and promptly got spun around as a result. While swerving to avoid being hit by Nato, spinning top impression, Gasly was piled driven by Sergio Canamassas, who you may recognise from my video on Johnny Chicotto Jr., which you should also watch, by the way. Now, it doesn't take Jolian Palmer's analysis videos to see that being creative with racing lines wins races, and although it didn't end too well for Pierre Gasly, creativity is always a good thing in my opinion, which is where today's sponsor comes in. If it weren't for me starting to use Skillshare about a year and a half ago, I would probably still be editing my videos on iMovie to an audience of 24 subscribers, so naturally, I was super excited when they reached out to sponsor today's video. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people, where you can learn to be creative obviously. I personally used it to learn Premiere Pro and Photoshop, but you may find you want to learn photography, craft, web design, or anything else from the ever-growing list of topics. One of the classes that really surprised me was the YouTube Success class by MKBHD, which taught me a lot of things I would never have realised about making videos. If you're interested in pursuing your own creativity, then just go to the link in the description of this video, which will give the first 1,000 people that click on it a one-month free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Thank you again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and let's see how our GP2 drivers are getting on over in Crashville. Also taken out in turn 1 was Marvin Kirchhofer? Kirkhofer? I'm really not entirely sure how to pronounce that one. Nicholas Latifi and Alex Lynn, which made it 5 retirements before 200 metres of the race, with a further one being spun around. But we weren't done there. Sergei Sorotkin lost his front wing end plate in turn 5, however I can't seem to find who he crashed into or any footage of the crash. Obviously these three incidents involving seven drivers meant the safety car had to be deployed, allowing for a few laps of calm before the crashing resumed on lap 3. Credit where credit's due, there were no incidents on the safety car restart, but it wasn't long until things were back to par when Filo Armand got too friendly with a barrier in turn 1, once again bringing out the safety car. Now while a lot of the incidents so far could have been repeated in F1 with nobody really being that surprised, the safety car restart on lap 8 was one of the most ridiculous things to come out of that weekend, with only half of what remained of the grid appearing to remember how to conduct a restart, meaning the running order was shaken up again to have Rafael Marcello leading from Nobuharu Matsushita. But it wasn't just the drivers who didn't know what was going on, the marshals didn't know whether to show green flags or the safety car board for some reason. Maybe they predicted the future though, as Arthur Peake collided with Artem Markolov and although the latter was able to drive off, he failed to make it to the castle section as a result of the damage sustained, and hit the wall in turn 7, bringing the safety car out for the third time. After the restart, there were a few moments of good clean racing, but only a few. Nabil Jeffrey locked up and had to take the escape road on lap 15, and just 4 clean laps later Norman Nato collided with his teammate, bringing Nato out of the race and bringing the safety car out for the 100th time. And mercifully, this would be its last appearance. 
of the day. Still, that's not to say that there were no more incidents, as Jordan King locked up after exiting the pit lane under safety car, demonstrated to Mahavira Gunathan how to properly do a three-point turn, and carried on for approximately two laps until he collided with Jimmy Erickson, taking both cars out of the race. Mercifully, the chequered flag dropped on lap 26, and all ten of the cars that crossed the line scored points, which would have told you all you needed to know. To be honest, this race more closely resembled an open lobby on F1 2021 than the second tier of motorsport, but oh well, there was still the sprint race for the drivers to prove us wrong, he said, while well, ironically setting up the viewers for the second half of this video. Really poor start for Galil and De Jong. Is Matushita going to be able to get into the lead? He's forced his way through at back into one. the slipstream, tries to redraft him down the inside, and here's a move for position that could end in tears, and will end in tears, and that could take all three of them out. Jordan King, Jimmy Erickson, and contact again for Jordan King in Baku. Can Amasas will escape? On the safety car restart, things were predictably amateur, with Nobuharu Matsushita almost pile driving the safety car and having to slam on the brakes, allowing Daniel de Jong to take the lead for approximately 5 seconds, before pretty much the entire grid locked up into turn 1, giving Matsushita the lead again. Philo Armand stacked it into the barriers in turn 7, bringing out the safety car yet again, which stayed out until lap 12. Now, you'd think that after so many safety car periods, the drivers would have figured out how to do a restart by now, but no, the lap 12 restart was just as chaotic as the the ones that came before it, if not even and worse. And that is the point. There it is. So you can overtake from that line there, and we're underway once again with green flag racing in Baku. Oh, it's going to be an accident there. That's Malia losing his front wing, and we could have a huge accident. They were all uncertain. Kanamasas losing debris. Matsushita was backing up the field, as is tradition in a restart. However, he failed to realise that he had to go after the safety car line, and neither did half of the grid. Predictably, that meant that half the grid was flat out, and the other half was going slowly, meaning another crash ensued, involving Gustav Malia, who crashed into the back of Mitch Evans's car, losing his front wing in the process. Sergio Kanamasas then ran over Malia's front wing, and lost his own front wing, which was probably the only time in his career when he lost the front wing and it wasn't his fault. Malia then crashed into Ollie Rowland in turn 1, sending Rowland into a spin. While taking avoiding action, Sean Galau went into the barriers as well, bringing the safety car out again. On the restart on lap 14, Matsushita, who was banned for the next race for his antics on the previous restart, crashed with Rafael Marcello, who'd locked up taking both cars out of contention, but miraculously not out of the race. Oh wait, no, never mind. Matsushita retired and became the final DNF of the weekend in doing so. On the final few laps, Gasly and Giovinazzi were pulling away from the rest of the pack, with Giovinazzi putting the pressure on Gasly for the lead, but then his DRS failed, making life significantly harder for him. However, Giovinazzi was ultimately given the race lead into turn one of the final lap, where Gasly locked up slightly and ran wide. After that, there were no more changes in positions, so Giovinazzi came home with the win. Oli Rowland binned it into an escape road on the last lap just to put the icing on the carbon fibre mess of a cake, but kept it going and made it out of the escape road to finish a lap down. So over the weekend, Antonio Giovinazzi took the pole and both wins, with Prima scoring their first 1-2 finish of many in the sprint race. While that may be an impressive statistic for Gio, the most impressive number was that of the DNFs, which amassed to 19 over the weekend, with three drivers failing to finish either of the races. As for whether or not this was the messiest race in motorsport, you'd have to also look at the Italian Formula 3 round of 2015 but for me, I think this is the worst. Not for the amount of crashes, but the fact that almost none of the drivers seemed competent. I mean, you sort of expect a worse quality of driving from F3, but by F2, the drivers should be nearly ready for Formula 1, or Mojave Ragoon. So for only half the field to know how to conduct themselves on a safety car restart, and for just six of the field to finish both races of the weekend is a pretty poor standard, if you ask me. Now, I personally found this race very entertaining to watch, as there was so much going on, but at the same time, the safety car was out so much of the time that there was barely any proper racing. If this sort of thing happened in Formula 1, I know we wouldn't have found it as funny though, because we watch Formula 1 to see the best of the best in the fastest cars in the world, and if only 6 of the drivers made it to the end of the weekend without damage, then we'd be rightfully annoyed. From my experience asking a few people about this race, it's about a 50-50 split as to whether or not they agree that this was the messiest race in motorsport, so what do you think? Let me know your opinions in the comments below. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, make sure to check them out via the link in the description, and and see where your creativity takes you. As always, if you enjoyed this video, then leave a like on it and subscribe if you're new. But otherwise, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you all later. Bye.